All right, good evening. You're watching live with Faye. Every evening at eight o'clock, we have a discussion. Remember, not a debate. This is a discussion where we listen to our panelists and learn from them, which also means that we carefully pick very learned people who can help us understand this subject much better at the end of the show than when we did at the beginning of the show. Um, I'm going to get straight to today's topic. Remind, remember, um, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends and family that we have this show every evening. Ask them to tune in as well. I had said initially that we will focus on the three major stories in India, COVID, the economy, and our relationship with China. But today I'm going to take up the case against Rhea Chakravarti. We're gonna take a closer look at it and understand it better. The reason why I want to do this is very simple. There are two things. One, uh, there is a young woman right now who is in Baikala jail, where hardened criminals are held, not in police lockup, but in Baikala jail. And we must understand how this case has progressed and what charges have been brought against her. Also, for the first time in nearly three months since all of this started, we actually have a document to look at and examine in this case, because up until now, it was all shouting and screaming and exchanging of uh, conspiracy theories. But this time, we actually have a document that the police or the Narcotics Bureau has filed. And so we're going to take a very close look at that document. That's the attempt here to understand what charges have been brought against her and how tight or loose or weak or strong this case really is. So it's been a day's worth of reading for me. Uh, so I'm gonna take a moment to just take you through what I have discovered and then we'll bring in our guests. Now the operative part of the remand document that was placed before the court yesterday, asking that she be given judicial custody, which means she be sent to jail as opposed to remand, which means she's kept in police lockup. The operative part of that document was one paragraph, which basically said, during her statement, Rhea Chakravarti accepted that she had been part of procurement of drugs and financial transactions and gave instructions to three others in this regard. Now, it says very clearly that the drugs in question is ganja, but it does not specify the quantum of the drug in question. It goes on to say, therefore, it is clear she is an active member of a drug syndicate and is in contact with supplies. And it is clear the respondent would procure the drugs for Sushant Singh Rajput. It says so in the document for consumption purpose. It also says that in the document. She has also been arrested under the Narcotics Drugs and Psychotropic Act, Section 8C, which is basically import, export, or interstate movement of psychotropic uh, substances, Section 20B, possession, buying and transportation of drugs, 27A, financing and harboring of offenders, 27, uh, 21, manufacturing drugs, 22, consuming drugs, 29, criminal conspiracy, and 28, attempt to commit the offense. So according to this law, even if you attempt to commit the offense, it's as bad as committing the offense itself. So this is a special law to deal with drugs in India. Now, there are several questions that arise from this document. Question number one. The contraband in question, the ganja that we're talking about, has not been seized from anyone. It has allegedly been smoked up. Hence, it's not available as part of evidence, and therefore it cannot be measured by forensics and presented to the court as part of evidence. And this is important because it's important to weigh it and figure out the size of this uh, contraband uh, seizure. Because under the narcotics law that I just read out, the punishment varies greatly depending on the size, on whether it was it was meant for commercial purpose, so was this actually a peddler who meant to sell it to a bunch of people, or a drug dealer, or a cartel, or was it meant for personal consumption? Now, the law calls this a small amount, but it doesn't specify what a small amount is. And that actually brings into a question. So for example, in the Fardeen Khan case, if you remember back from 2001, a small amount was one gram of cocaine. And that led to a lower charge in this particular case. But what is a small amount as far as Ganga is concerned? We don't know. I did some reading. There is a case of Lavish Kumar versus the state, 6th October 2015, where a small amount was, was anything less than 20 kgs in Ganja. And it had to be, so the seeds had to be removed because technically the seeds are not considered a narcotic substance, just the leaves and the buds. And so after removing the leaves and the, bud, uh, the seeds, it had to be at least 20 kgs to be considered commercial. Otherwise, it was, uh, it would be, uh, you know, for personal consumption. Personal consumption is imprisonment of six months and commercial is 10 years. Big difference between the two. 
other questions we have to ask. If the drugs were bought for personal use then, how can the accused be part of a syndicate, which by definition from the dictionary is a group of criminals who source and distribute drugs with a common goal of making money? How is she part of, how is she a, a professional criminal if she was buying for personal use? If she had bought it for uh, Susan Singh Rajput, which the NCP has acknowledged in their remand copy, why is she being accused also under the other sections for manufacturing drugs, consuming the drugs and moving them across state and national borders? And there are some, like I said, this small amount, I tried to read up about it, but the list of psychotropic substances according to the law in Schedule 5 of the Gazette is notoriously difficult to find as well. Now, it's interesting, and I want to share this one piece of information that popped up. And when we, uh, you know, when we look at what the NCB has been saying about this investigation, we saw Mukta Ashok Jain, Deputy DG NCP, made a statement saying we normally look at international and interstate connections and big fish. This is not part of our mandate, but because we're getting the information, we will not shrug our responsibility. Effectively, the alleged 56 or 59 grams of ganja is work for a beat constable, not for a national investigating agency like the NCB. So why is the NCB looking at this case? If you take a closer look at the NCB uh, and uh, reports, uh, the NCB is a national organization meant to actually look at state uh, that drugs that are crossing the borders, either nationally or state-wise. The NCB reports to the Home Ministry and is headed by Rakesh Astana. Rakesh Astana, incidentally, is also heading the Border Security Force, which is interesting because some people in the IPS tell us that they're not allowed to hold two positions at once. Now, he's familiar because he used to be the additional director of the CBI back in 2018 when he locked horns with Director uh, Alok Varma of the CBI on charges of corruption. He was then cleared of those charges and given the Border Security Force and the Narcotics Bureau to head. He is a Gujarat cadre police officer. That's a lot of information that we've just dug up, uh, but fundamentally it brings us back to the same question. Why is the NCB chasing this case? The CBI, the ED, the Mumbai police, the Bihar police, are they really pawns really in the hands of their political masters? And if that is true, where does that leave us? Now, let me bring in my guests. I have really cool guests joining us this evening. Mr. Arima Sundaram is a senior advocate with the Supreme Court, someone I respect greatly, who's been kind enough to give us his time. We'll also have Keitha Lutra, uh, who's also an advocate, join us through the course of this conversation. Mr. Sundaram, good evening, and thank you for joining us. Um, uh, thank you for waiting patiently while I took my audience through, the, through what we found on this case. But in that remand copy, these questions of the fact that we don't know what has been seized, uh, there's no clarity on the size of the substance we're talking about. There's been a liberal application of sections. What is your reaction to the strength of this case? Well, quite frankly, I cannot have a reaction at all because uh, I don't think in the history of NCB they have ever been connected with a case like this. Mm. You know, these kind of cases come up when the police raid a rave party, when they go in, when they hear in a nightclub, some drugs are being consumed. This case is no more or no less than that. So at least let's look at it this way. The NCB now has decided to spread its uh, influence over all areas. Hey, I, you know, I have a lot to comment on this, Ramandra. Before Please. I do, I think I should give you a bit of a preface which you cannot get away from. There has been a huge amount of stirred up public interest, public opinion, media hype, hype of every nature you can, mm. about the death of Sushant Singh Rajput, who suddenly became a cult figure. Yes. Perhaps in his death, even better known than in his lifetime, without in any way uh, saying that he was not a very good actor. I mean, I for one thought. Now, that death then entered conspiracy theories, other theories. So they said, now, was it suicide? Was the Bombay police involved? Then it became a political issue. Bombay versus Bihar versus Delhi. And then it became an issue as to whether it was really a homicide and not a suicide. And was it too soon called a suicide? Therefore, investigate homicide. Therefore, CBI should come in. And there is definitely something at play by which time public fervor had boiled up so much that you have to find a target and the readily available target. Was found. 
Now here was the girl's girlfriend who split with him just a few days before that. First, they started the theory of she had driven him to suicide and therefore he killed himself. And the question was, if a man kills himself because his relationship broke up, well, that's not a bitman to suicide at all. So then he went into homicide theories and the family got into play. And that again became a bit controversial because family which hadn't seen him or talked to him was suddenly felt that they had been deprived of somebody very close. You know, I'm not commenting on the right or the wrong of all this, but let's see the background. It's in this background that suddenly the ED came into play. CBI comes into play, ED comes into play because suddenly you've gone into siphoning of funds, parking of money, etc. Now again, that is drawing a blank... Uh, or oh, you come against a blank wall there. So then suddenly ED finds one uh, some, a conversation regarding asking for uh, marijuana or some drugs. So they pass it on to NCB. Now NCB says, all right, let us investigate. And the entire thing became a case which is basically nothing more than a case of a group of people who obviously enjoyed uh, using drugs uh, uh, coming up in now becoming a national case of arrest. And you have to think about it, Faye, if these people are being arrested for this, I think half of socialite, if public perception be right, I'm not saying it is, half of socialite Delhi, Goa, Bombay, Bangalore should be arrested. Half of the film industry should be arrested. Half of the fashion industry should be arrested. In fact, I think half of a lot of halves will have to be arrested. So if you look at it that way, that is what is going to be the effect. So we have to start with the basis that what it really was, it's a question of drug consumers, similar to drug consumers all over the country. But these drug consumers have now become national figures. Mm. Now, if they're national figures, I think we're going to have about 5 million national figures very soon, if, if the same yards degree. Now, let me come to this one. You know, the saddest part of it was, this whole thing started with a justice for Sushant. Poor Sushant has been murdered and there's a conspiracy, he's been looted of his money, everything has been done. Let us at least after his death give justice to Sushant. You know what saddens me? Is that the dead can't speak. Mm. The effect of that remand report, if you look at it, has painted Sushant as a drug addict, has painted Sushant as a depressive. And if you look at that report of NCP, then the story of his suicide arising out of depression seems very real. So the whole purpose of the initial exercise seems to have been lost. Now, what makes it even worse is that the remand report immediately claims that she is part of a drug syndicate who are procuring drugs for Sushant. What does that mean then? That means that Sushant was the actual procurer for drugs. And they were just getting the drugs for him. Which means, if this case, Sushant was alive, he would have been first accused. He would have been the first accused in the case because he's the one who's procuring to these people. Because they themselves say drug syndicate were procuring drugs for Sushant. Makes them agents for him. So you've actually brandished Sushant as a drug addict who has procured drugs and if he was alive would have been the first accused in this case and would probably be in jail. Now look at what you've done for this justice for Sushant. Now coming down to that, look at this procuring drugs for Sushant. Yes. Look, law is a very strange thing. Now let us assume that this Ria and Sushant had no relationship. Let's assume that Sushant would ask Ria, please, I need some drugs. Priya would then get the drugs and then sell it to Sushant. Give it to him. Collect the money for the drugs. Maybe she wasn't keeping it. Maybe she's passing. Then she's a supplier of drugs. It's a totally different case. But assume she is the wife. She's his partner. She's living with him. They're in a relationship. And he, for whatever reason, says, look, I'm not going to Paul asked for it directly. Why don't you just ask for it for me? Does that make her a supplier? Certainly not, because she's acting by the remand report itself at his behest yes. or him. Yes. So it's not as though she's the procurer. He's the procurer. Now, if she was a third person, you can always say she was the supplier. 
But the point is, she is his alter ego, so to speak. She is his uh, partner. So basically, as per that remand report, you cannot hold her to be a supplier. She is not even the procurer because she has acted on behalf of him. Yes, she is guilty to an extent, definitely yes, but not the way that it's made out to be, as though she is the equivalent of a drug peddler or anything like that. Again, the monies which are paid for it, if they're living together on the one hand, you're saying that she's living and siphoning his money. And where's the question of her having paid the money? He, it's his money which has gone for those drugs. Take the same logic. After all, the whole charge is that she was siphoning his money. The one of the parents say something about she lived off him, she lay everything he paid for, etc. That means he's paying for it. So basically what she has done is, he says, look here, I need some uh, dope right now. So she tells a person, please get me some for him. I'm only going on the remand report. The story. Absolutely, yes. And now I'm asking in that light of that, what are all these sections which are being thrown? I mean, and actually, if you look at that uh, remand report, uh, it's actually a prototype. In most of these cases, you'll find remand reports which are so similar, they'll all read the same thing. This word drug syndicate is one of the most favorite expressions to be used. It's almost like it's been patented in drug cases. You know, it's, it's almost like it's in all these cases you find it. But actually, if you separate the shaft from the grain, what you really find is that here is a girl who was living with a man who she was in love with and they are partners. The man is a drug addict and she has asked for the drugs for him. Mm. And she is not forcefully feeding the drugs to him because he is a drug addict, according to this demand report. I'd hate to believe it, but that's what the demand report says. And therefore, she is at his behest. Now, which, I'm sorry to put it this way, I'm anything but uh, uh, I'm a sickness. But let's accept reality. A woman is in love with a man and the man says, look, do this. She does it. It's a reality of life. It does happen. So when I look at this remand report, I cannot understand how these sections came in because you can always bring in these sections technically. You know, I move drugs. How did I move drugs? I took it from this place and I moved it to the other place. You can take it literally. But that's not what it means. Small quantity. What is a small quantity? Again, this is um, matters which are really left to the imagination to a great extent. But the fact is, you must understand that procurement means something else. It's procuring large quantities for a certain purpose. Why? Because the act itself is kind on consumers. Act itself recognizes that consumption of drugs is in many ways a disease. It is not something to be encouraged, but at the same time, it's not something to throw a person into jail and throw away the key out. Mm -hmm. That is why a consumer of drugs has a very light sentence. It's six months or fine. Why? Because the consumer is not the person you're interested in. It's the man who is actually pushing drugs, peddling drugs, supplying drugs, manufacturing drugs. These are the people the law is really after. Now, I ask myself, look at that whole framework. Does she fit into anything there? Does Riya Chakravarti fit into this thing of the person who's manufacturing drugs, pushing drugs, peddling drugs, is uh, trying to get people to uh, take drugs, uh, you know, in all kinds of ways? On the contrary, the report itself says, she procured drugs for Sushant. Who's yes. her love? Who's her lover? Who she's living with? Who's her partner? Well, in which case, she's not even a consumer. She's not even a consumer of drugs, as per that remand report. It's her lover was a consumer of drugs and asked her to get him the drugs. I don't know what kind of sentence you'd give for that. At the most, you'd say, I bet a consumer, therefore the same sentence as a consumer. That's the maximum you can say. And more than that, I can only say that I, I, I can use one word for this remand report. Uh, I would say that it is in many ways self-contradictory to what it's trying to say. Many ways it helps Riya Chakravarti, if you ask me. And finally, as a lawyer, I would say I find it amusing. Well, amusing for a lot of people, but not for Riya Chakravarti, who not is now in the Baikala jail and she's going to 
uh, be there. We understand that she has a bail hearing now. In the next two days, uh, Senior Advocate Geeta Lutra joins us as well. Ms. Lutra, good evening and thank you for joining us. Uh, you were listening to Mr. Sudarab's arguments. Um, my point also is, and I had a couple of conversations today with some very senior retired IPS officers, former DGPs of police of different states, who said that they had actually never seen A, the NCP get involved in a case of this size, 56 grams of marijuana. Also, they'd never seen an arrest and judicial custody granted in a case of this, uh, this quantum, where there is no evidence that has been seized on the person of the accused. I want to understand how you see the strength of this case. Do you agree with Mr. Sundaram? And without the actual, you know, contraband to check and weigh and submit as evidence, where can this case really go? See, this case has gone where it wanted to go, basically to see Ria's arrest. So I think it's really gone where it intended to go. But it's very sad and very unfortunate. According to me, at a in India, there are the cases against real consumers, as Mr. Sundram said, are not really filed. Those who are, and she's not even a consumer. Mm. So she's a person who, in fact, we don't even know if her phone was used by him. We don't even know if those SMSs or WhatsApp messages are, uh, are admissible. What we have to go by is because under this act, statements made to the investigative agency are admissible. So we have something which is put on her, which is why we as lawyers keep saying, you cannot make statements made to an investigating, investigating agency. You can't be making them admissible because what happens is People, you can't keep a girl for eight hours, 10 hours, six hours, three days for a SMS or WhatsApp of this kind of nature, which even its admissibility is questioned, its probity is questioned. Some of the SMSs, WhatsApp seem to be three, four years old. One seems to be uh, not too, uh, too much in the recent past, but what is the criminality it's coming, is coming out? And the sections that you are imposing on her, which is 8C and 27 and I think 20, they are they're trying to make serious cases. I don't, I can't see where it's heading. You know, there are provisions under the act which say that if there is a person who's a consumer, who's trying to mend himself, you he will be protected. So you're even protecting consumers. If here she's not even a consumer, she you're not, you're not even alleging consumption by her. So 64A gives immunity and look at where the country is going. You apparently there is a study by the ministry which seems to say in 2019, which says that if we were to actually count the cannabis consumers, it would be to the tune of some 3 million or something. We, uh, in a country where it's been consumed in the form of ganja, where you have, you are in Shivaji's land, where you say that you consume this, you have these pakoras, you have all that in such a country. Wow. Yes. In religious country, yes. we are talking about it being a serious offense. Surely we have to take out time. There are cases where you see uh, two trucks, five trucks, 2,400 kilos, so many kilos. Those are cases where you go after in NDPS cases. You go against those who are selling, those who are uh, procuring those who are manufacturing, those who are actually trying to encourage people to get into consumption by mass selling of such things. And that also more serious drugs. Canada, it's legalized. US in many states is legalized. Europe in yes. most states is legalized. I don't know where we are going. Yes, Ms. Ms. Luta, one second. I just want to bring in Mr. Sundaram because I know he has to leave in a, in a few minutes. Mr. Sundaram, I don't understand this. Uh, given how weak the case is, 
given the fact that the ncb said that they didn't want remand but they would like her to be in judicial custody which i still don't understand other than it just being vindictive and they just wanting to send her to jail with hardened criminals where there is a covid outbreak i don't understand the the need to do that in the middle of a pandemic why was this this custody granted well i have a very simple answer for you very yes. simple answer number 1 they did not just say uh, no remand they asked for judicial remand saying that she may tamper with the evidence to what extent this girl can tamper the evidence with uh, 48 uh, newsmen behind her every second i don't think she even has privacy in the four corners of her bedroom it's uh, i don't know what tampering of evidence could be or that she would use some influence to influence witnesses well all the other witnesses also seem to be put in jail in this matter so i really don't see any ground why she was proceeded against in this manner and the the narcotics bureau was so keen to put her in this man i have a simple example from mythology you may have heard of this yes great weapon called the brahmastram yes the brahmastram was a weapon which could destroy anything it was it hit but it had one problem once it was released from the bow you could not bring it back it had to reach the target now here unfortunately brahmastram was released for her against her so it was originally planned through the bihar police the cbi then the ed and all those were missing the target but the brahmastram had to hit somewhere so ed passes on this one message regarding this drugs to the ncb and the ncb then picks up the brahmastram and pokes it in the moment the ncb took up that case he had to be arrested period there was no way because otherwise the brahmastram has has no effect and after all it's infallible so the infallibility of the state had to be shown so the ncb had to arrest now hey you're a person from the media so i need hardly tell you how the media has gone on about this uh i think everyone is human to an extent are moved by the media people tend to believe anything ill about a person before they disbelieve it they rather believe the ill than the good so the media went on it the public opinion went on it and the court was faced with this case which had a number of offenses and at the stage of bail we decided not to go into a question as to whether any of these offenses are actually made out but just went on the basis of the nature of the offenses and the offenses claimed and that's why i said the brahmastram had to hit which is why all these nonsensical sections have been brought in the court said all these sections are involved we carry 10 years and their life or whatever else it is 10 years and 15 years and therefore this would be a case to remand uh, that is the most sympathetic way and i repeat the most sympathetic way i can look at the order of the court as a lawyer i'd like to look at the court's order howsoever disagreeable it is to any sense of logic to me sympathetically and that is the sympathetic way i would look at it well mr sudarab effectively what you are saying if i may decode it for my audience is if i was a judge i'd have granted bail you'd have granted bail <laughs> uh is that the bihar police the cbi the ed the narcotics control bureau have all been called into action for effectively a narrative that was created on television that we now understand would suit a government's election promise which has now emerged with a photograph of sushant singh rajput on it what my concern is then is that it suggests to me as an ordinary citizen that tomorrow even though i pay my taxes and i mind my own business these guns could then be trailed and and straight you know pointed at us because we just might become convenient fodder this is really scary because these are important institutions of investigation that we have to trust i mean where is caesar's wife in all of this uh, i think the days of caesar's wife have gone i think uh, calpurnia died with caesar <laughs> <laughs> 
so 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 where does that leave us? How do how do how do any of us? Well, know the fact of it is, I'm a great believer as a lawyer that uh, justice will prevail. Unfortunately, uh, some people have to go through the various travels, various sufferings before they get that justice. Now, this is a very sad case of a girl who's been put in jail. I, I'm not commenting on the other issues because it's all under investigation, the CBI, the ED, everything. But in this particular case, I think it's very sad that she should be uh, incarcerated in this manner. I don't think it's called for in this case. And I feel it's also happened. Sorry to tell you that the whole government machinery in this case has worked fair because of you. Not you, Faye, but the tribe you belong to. I apologize on behalf of the tribe I belong to. <clears throat> the fact is, the government always reacts to public opinion. Yes. What they see is public opinion. And in this case, I think the government may have reacted to public opinion. Apart from the inbuilt rivalry between the state of Bihar and the state of uh, Maharashtra, Maharashtra and that interplay political fight between the two states, etc., I think uh, she was collateral damage also. Well, that is a pity. Um, I, I do understand you You have to leave, Mr. Sundaram. Thank you for joining us. Ms. Lutra, um, you know, um, a, a lot of people who are on this show might have watched Narcos on Netflix, which was about Pablo Escobar. What effectively the NCB has done is they've made Rhea Chakravarti, who apparently, allegedly, um, you know, passed on the message that her live-in partner wanted 26 grams of ganja Seeds included, we don't know because we don't know what this ganja looked like, which has since been smoked up. They've made her look like Pablo Escobar because they've said that she's running a cartel and she's financing and she's harboring and she's moving your import, export and across state borders. Um, she's currently in jail, which is a violation of her fundamental right as a citizen. How did we get to this point? I mean, so where has the law left us? See, unfortunately, the law with uh, regard to NDPS, because of the nature of the law, had to be very strict. And I'm not making a defense. I'm just saying uh, this as a fact. And because whenever you impose a very strict, stringent law, the stricter it is, the yes. more is the risk of its abuse. And that, unfortunately, is perhaps one of the reasons why the court thought twice about granting bail, because you are looking at a provision which has minimum 10 years, 20 years. You're, you're a magistrate. You're asking a, a judge at the uh, first, first level that you are telling him that you want bail when he's being produced for remand. Now, 10 to 20 years, normally bails are not given as a matter of course in NDPS cases. And that is why the provision needs to be guarded and why the Supreme Court says that, or rather the enactment says that the person who even takes a person into custody the provision is extremely strict under the law, under Section 50 and I think 42 of the enactment. Now, the more stringent the punishment, the more strict should be the compliance with the law so that you can't abuse it. But unfortunately, in this case, they have put in very stringent provisions knowing that a court of first instance would be scared of grant, granting bail because normally the argument that you have to make is that I am not guilty of any NDPS offense and mm -hmm. hence grant yes. me bail. But, but, but Ms. Lucha, I, I want to, uh, if I may, just challenge one point here. And I read through the entire the law um, and it says very clearly it, it's a small amount. So there is a distinction, like you said yourself, between someone who's there commercially and someone who is actually just procuring perhaps for, for personal use or recreational use, however we want to call it. Um, 
and this the distinction is made based on the size of the consignment or the seizure here there is no there is no consignment there is no seizure you can't measure it there's no fsl that's going to happen no forensics is going to happen so on what basis have they argued that this is a 10 to 15 years case they don't have the basic evidence for that argument so so whenever if it's a case like um, makoka or a case of terrorist offense or a case of ndps these are considered the most serious of serious cases and the punishment is the most strict in such cases the court say don't grant bail so the only circumstances and those are judgments of the supreme court that where you can grant bail is where you say that actually we look at it carefully as counsel and you look at it remand application line by line you will see that actually none of these provisions are made out 8c 2720 yes. and so on so that's the argument i'm sure the council must have made but then a court at first instance may be hesitant and look ultimately media does affect the decision it's it's a extremely dark day in so far as human rights are concerned according to me and i feel it's not anything else but anybody could be unfortunately a victim like this anybody and that's what is according to me the sad aspect of unfortunate aspect of this case and let's hope that it is rectified now the other aspect that you said which is the ncb says we don't need further investigation yes but we still say remand now there is a difference between police remand and judicial remand so police yes. remand is granted when you want further investigation you want to question the person so when they say they've questioned for some such thing like this if they've questioned 20 hours got admissions got statements which she says is under coercion you really don't want anything more coming from her so you say don't police remand we don't need but let, give her judicial command, uh, remand send her to jail the court then looks at it and there are judgments and judgments one of course is that the enactment itself presumes no bail but unless you are innocent but what you do is you the other argument which is made in police cases is mostly this that it's a very serious offense it's punishable with 20 years and that's why they loaded these sections because for a court of first instance okay 20 years 10 years minimum 1 lakh minimum fine this kind of offense there could be tampering with witnesses there could be running away from the country those are the twin factors which are normally looked at by a court of law of course does it does it uh, miss lutra does it not matter that in this particular case the individual in question raya chakravarti has actually uh, complied with everything every questioning she has appeared on you know she spent the three days four days she has not shirked uh, she's not a flight risk obviously in the pandemic she's not going to go anywhere so is does that count for anything see according to me it does count because if it was a case if somebody had not been coming uh, and so when it was ed but they won't look one department will look in its own little window unless they want to attack a person that she didn't go to ed but where she's complied they will not be looking at it they'll say look we are only concerned about the ncb and her compliances here but the problem is the 10 years 20 years and the problem is that this case's ramifications put such a burden on we shouldn't i mean judiciary should not get burden but it is a burden because mm -hmm. as the supreme court itself has said that you know ultimately we are human although the supreme court tries and the courts and the senior the court the more stronger it can be courts try not to look at anything which may be media centric but 
the whole aspect is that let's just hope that mm. in a higher court the court looks at the remand application and looks at the evidence which has been collected so far and then uh, comes to a decision which let's hope will uh, will be a ray of hope for riya um you you are absolutely right about that um, you know there used to be a time i understand when judges of the supreme court would read the morning paper in the evening because they didn't want it to influence their day but now in the era of social media and really really loud television channels who are screaming at you one wonders if those uh, cable connections to the judges home should be maybe just slipped quietly at night so they don't get access to this uh, which media is coverage. why which is why you sequester a jury so that mm -hmm. the jury does not get access to all this now actually courts are supposed to be above beyond this because of their training but um, uh, unfortunately or the whole um, social media it is very recently that the us also for the first time because it really believe it really said freedom of speech you know first amendment freedom of speech and therefore said let's not put any any fetters on social media or media but now with trials becoming such a match matter of uh, media speculation now there there is a rethought going that should there be certain self imposed restrictions yes La my last my last question to you before i run out of time with you ms lutra is this um and you did say in a higher court we understand that uh, riya chakraborty has an appeal for bail in a higher court in the next couple of days but there are two other national agencies who are still investigating her. the ed and the cbi investigations are not closed they just haven't come up with anything yet is there a possibility given the nature of these various investigations that while she is granted bail by the court on one count a new count will actually emerge and she might find herself under arrest from outside the court gates which we've seen happen in the past so unfortunately this is what happens now that there are so many investigating agency even say an accused say of a offense of cheating may first be arrested in an fir and the moment he is off in one case he may be arrested by the ed or he is getting off before while he is on his way out the ed would invest arrest him and while he is on his way out the sfio may swing into action so there is a big disadvantage of having multiple investigative agencies because it does tell on the freedom of the individual and the courts are chary of interfering with investigation because the courts say that this is the job of the investigative agency so we can't spoil their or we can't interfere with their job so what happens as a result is that sometimes mm. a person has to go through multiple incarceration which should not be happening because it should be a single pronged look and yes. i can only say for her this that the very fact that so far the ed has not thought of arresting her maybe that they felt that a strong case is not being made out against us against her but we we can't really know yes what's going on there Ms. Lutra, thank you so much for spending time with us and answering all of those questions so very, very patiently. Thank you to all of our viewers, Amit Verma, particularly for your financial support and your appreciation of my T-shirt. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, this has been an extremely informative conversation. This is the kind of conversation that will help us understand what is going on, and we must realize. And for me, the deepest, my deepest problem with all of this has been the chaos. We're living in the middle of chaos. We have governments. who should be focusing on the pandemic where india currently is registering the highest number of deaths anywhere in the world a thousand people are dying every day in our country simply of covid 
we have eyeball to eyeball action with china at minus 5 degrees temperatures and we have troops standing there unable to drop their shoulders because of the tension at that border that should be the focus we have an economy that is in desperate need of rescuing and no rescuing is in sight it has been 100 days since the government suggested they might come up with a solution we've seen no solution that is a problem farmer suicides being reported from across the country unemployment being reported from across the country in in cities like bangalore there are reports of chain snatching and phone snatching from young people aged 14 and 15 obviously because there isn't enough money in the house these are our problems right now 56 grams of marijuana slash weed slash ganja is not a problem for our central agencies to be focusing on can we please have a little bit of perspective in this country also we cannot have central agencies being influenced by the media that has seemed to have completely lost its bearing on what its job is which is running reality tv in competition with general entertainment right now we have central agencies coming in to investigate ordinary people and putting up such weak cases that i have lawyers having trouble keep a straight face at that remand copy because it is laughable it is ridiculous it is embarrassing that we've had to have this conversation today it is embarrassing and the scary part about it is tomorrow it could be you or me if it is convenient for the media and the agencies and the governments to win elections to distract it could be us tomorrow it could be your kids it could be your sister your brother your aunt and the manner in which this family has been treated for something like 56 grams of wheat for heaven's sake we need to stop and introspect on who we have become it's because we are giving our attention to these television channels because we are not demanding more from the media more from the police more from the investigating agencies and more from our judiciary and for heaven's sake more from our elected government because we are willing to get distracted by sex drugs and rock and roll we don't want to listen to the hard stories about the farmer who put the food on your plate is just killed himself you don't want to hear the hard stories about about rights of people that are being crushed about migrant laborers who had to walk to their villages and are now starving there you don't want to hear the truth about troops who are being shot at the border you want the easy story and we're going to have to pay with our freedom for it it is not a laughing matter it is our fundamental and most basic right in this country Yeah, Chakravarti today has lost that fundamental, most basic right, and she lost it because we allowed it to happen. This is on us. We have to wake up tomorrow morning and do better, demand better, be better. Only then will we have a country, a government, a police, and the judiciary and the media that we deserve if we are better. Thanks for watching. Good night.